for today's topic, uh, we we have a uh, our topic is how to write an operative report, and we have uh, Dr. Maheshwaran Pichamuthu from uh, the University of Oklahoma. Uh, Mahesh is a good friend, pretty well known in uh, learning general surgery. He's a transplant surgeon by training and a HPB surgeon. Um, he recently moved back to US to take up a position in the University of Oklahoma as an assistant professor in transplant surgery. And uh, we are glad to have him back on the learning general surgery. He's done quite a few of our presentations. He's a well accomplished uh, transplant and HPB surgeon. He worked in PSG Medical College uh, Hospital uh, when he was in India and uh, adept in doing uh, advanced laparoscopic surgeries, including labdone and nephrectomies and uh, single incision laparoscopic surgeries. So we are glad to have Maheshwaran with us again. Uh, for moderating the session, we've had uh, Dr. Baskaran, who's one of the senior surgical gastroenterologists uh, in the city, but uh, Dr. Baskaran uh, is currently caught up in an emergency. So uh, he will join after he completes his operative procedure. So with this brief, we'll hand over the podium to Dr. Maheshwaran for, for the topic. Thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, good evening, Dr. Patar Radhakrishnan. It's always a pleasure to be with the Learning General Surgery Forum. Um, I mean, like uh, talking about how to write an operative note, you know, sometimes looks like, oh, this is a basic and uh, why we are talking about it. I mean, like everybody does as a surgeon, we do uh, every day in and out. Like we do a lot of surgeries. We always write operative notes and uh, you know, why we need to concentrate on this particular topic. And I'm, I'm glad that Ilangoy has brought up this topic because um, writing an operative note, it's not like just, you know, uh, we just document what we have done. It has got a lot of implications. So we need to be very cautious of what we are doing with our operative report. It is not just like an another document that we write on, on patient's notes. And uh, why it is very important is like, as I said, it's one, it's a legal implication. Number two is like, it is actually very important for the continuity of the care of the patients, okay? So with that, uh, providing an appropriate documentation, whether it is operative notes or clinical notes, or you're writing, you know, a distance summary, everything is like, you know, providing an appropriate, you know, documentation is not only good practice, it's a professional and also it's a legal requirement. And um, the operation note should be legible and it should always, we have to give a copy or some you know, information about the operative note to the patient's documentation so that they can carry on with them. And uh, we need to give you know, enough detail uh, in the operative report. So it will be helpful and easy for the continuity of the care for the patients, okay? And you know, I think India is also evolving in a situation where we do get a lot of referrals from the primary physicians. So whenever we, you know, uh, we got a patient or referral, then we do, you know, surgeries or we do give management, but we need to give an appropriate, you know, feedback or the information to the referring physician back so that if the patient is going to have a continuity of care over there, then they'll be able to, you know, follow that. And historically, I mean, like, I don't know how many people are still writing handwritten notes. Like, you know, I, I believe, you know, I can still remember my uh, postgraduate days where we write, I mean, we do the surgery and we go to the back corridor and we all sit in the floor and we write the operative notes by hand. And, you know, it's it's okay to write with, uh, with you know, handwritten operative notes provided it is legible. But the problem with, you know, doing that is like one, if you are doing a very long surgery, for example, you know, obviously, you know, transplant, pupils procedure, or even a you know, laparotomy in the middle of the night, we always get really tired. And uh, sometimes if we do in the middle of the night, it's really difficult to concentrate on what we are doing. I mean, obviously surgeons are very alert during surgery because that is their passion, that they love surgery, say so they don't usually don't make much mistakes during surgery but when they come to the operative report or operative note what do they think they give a little bit of least importance so you know sometimes we miss things and uh, uh, that can cause problem so the handwritten operative notes we use a lot of abbreviation because we are tired okay and we don't want to spend a lot of time we want to just 
get on with our work, like just finish the case and then we write the notes quickly and then we go to the next one. So usually we use a lot of abbreviation people may not know. And the legibility, it depending upon who writes. And uh, you know, um, there are certain units where there are a lot of junior doctors who can write that. And sometimes they do a very good job in writing, but they don't have enough information what to write. And sometimes the senior doctors write. I mean, I don't deny that a lot of senior doctors who do what called you know handwritten legible operative report. But I can, you know, we can count with the with the fingers how many people are doing that. And again, it's uh, if you go to the village or anywhere, if somebody writes something wrong, you know, it's the way they say, "Hey, you're like writing like a doctor." Nobody can understand. So that is the kind of handwriting, you know, most of our doctors, even with the prescription. So you know, legibility may be a bit difficult, and the, the accurate description of the procedure is really important because you know any procedure can be in a couple of ways. So it will help in future care. So this is phased in all surgical fields. And I recently you know, got some research and it is mainly in the orthopedic, you know, it's going to be like extremely, extremely you know, poor. So next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an operative report, you know, and I'm just going to show that to the floor and see how many of you can read that operative report. And followed by what I'm going to do is what are the guidelines available to write the operative report? We do, I mean, it's surprising to see like there are guidelines, you know, even though, you know, when we do in training, it's been told by our seniors. So we just sort of follow whatever, you know, our seniors are saying, but there are guidelines available. Surprising enough, there are a lot of, you know, there is an audit, audits being done on how to write a post-operative note. And, you know, what are the other options that we have to write, you know, good post-operative note? This is what I'm going to cover today. So, so this is an operative report. Right. Okay. And, and you can see it on the screen. Can anyone, I mean, I can tell you this is from one of the developed countries. It is not from, you know, um, third world or uh, poor country or something like that. This is the operative report. Okay. And can you see, you know, what, what surgery has been done, to be honest? And what is the description? What is the post op? That's a great example. So, retroperitoneal mass, excision of retroperitoneal mass. No, actually, it is retropetalar. Prepetalar mass. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And there are a lot of the body of the description. I'm not able to see what it is. Actually, there's a lot of things that has been written. And imagine. We are all qualified doctors. Okay, we know what is petalized. We know what is uh, you know retroperitoneum is and all those things. But with us, you know, even we are struggling to read what has been written. Imagine this note goes to the post-operative ward, and post-operative instruction has been written like this. How can we expect the nurses to carry out the orders for the patient? So I mean. The legibility actually comes, you know, has got a lot of weightage because if you don't write legible and you cannot pinpoint, you know, like, you know, something goes wrong, then you can say, hey, I've written this, why are you not following this? But actually nobody can read your handwriting. So it's going to be extremely, extremely difficult for us to, you know, uh, not only for us, even for the healthcare sector, nurses, physiotherapists, pharmacists, so many people struggle. You know, I've, I've, I've come across a lot of occasions where, if the nurses will come and ask, hey, he has written operative notes, he's given some post-op you know, instructions, I don't know what it is. Do you think it's an antibiotic or is an IV fluid? Some rate has been mentioned. Is it 15 or is it 50? So these kind of questions raise, but you know, we can advise the nurses if we can, but we cannot you know, give wrong advice to them also. So sometimes we may feel like, oh, should not give this advice to the nurses. You need to say, hey, you need to call the person who has written the operative notes and the post-op instruction, ask them. So they'll be able to give a bit more information because we don't want to make any mistakes, especially the in the you know medical profession, there is a lot of legalities. So we need to be very, very careful in what we are writing and how we are writing. And you know, you know, the same thing, like you know, in, in any note, there is omission also be a negligence. So you cannot omit some information because omission can also can lead to you know uh, legal issues. So there are some guidelines. Uh, it's the general medical councils is given a good medical practice. You know, it not only for general medical council in the UK. It's everywhere. We need to follow a good medical practice. It's 
you know, not only for the operative notes, it's, it's given, you know, the guidelines to write any notes, write clearly and concisely. So you need to put the information across whenever you write the operative report. And if you want to use, you know, something to specify a highlight, you can use different colored ink. I mean, obviously we don't have much time to do all those different colored ink other than writing in exams. And you need to document the timing when we are doing these cases. When we do the surgery, we need to mention the side, whether it is right or left, what type of, you know, uh, anesthesia we are producing, whether it's an emergency procedure, elective procedure, what are, who are all the people involved in surgery? And we need to give the detailed description of what is a preoperative preparation procedure, any additional procedure or any other additional medications you have given, all this information that we need to provide. And this is followed by full description of the operation. I like this because this is called IFPC, you know, method of writing. It's actually, you know, I know subconsciously most of us are doing that, but it's, it should be like, you know, we need to put it in a specific way so that people will understand what is, you know, IFPC incision findings, procedure and closure. Okay. So we need to do what type of incision are we uh, putting and findings is the important thing because that gives a lot of information and procedure step-by-step -step of what we have done. I mean, you don't need to write, you know, I got the artery and ligated the artery. I, you can just put a simple word like I, hemostasis done by sutures dietarily or like a, you know, um, other method of, you know, energy devices. You can use all those things, but you don't need to eat each and individualize like every step, like a, I like a small artery in the skin. You don't need to do that, but we all, you know, do that, but important. And what is important for the surgery, we need to document that. And also we need to mention any specimens we've taken, any cultures we have taken. So all this information, any process that we've implanted, because these got an implication and closure technique, how we close and importantly, you know, that thing that mostly we forget about this is a post-op instruction and we don't sign. And uh, that is the, you know, if we don't sign anything, it is not legally binded. So it's just nothing. So we need to be very careful in writing that. I can give you a scenario, um, you know, hopefully this give bits of insight of what, what we have to do. Um, in the UK, I, I know you might have come across something called fish. Fish is like nothing but a rubber or plastic uh, material, which, you know, when we try to close the wound, we put like a sponge to make sure the bowel is not protruding to the screen. So they have some sophisticated thing called fish, like a rubbery material that they can put it underneath the fascia and then they can close. And then we can just, when you pull it out, it comes like a rubber, like a single thing. So it's easy to do that. So a patient had a laparotomy and after a week patient had some signs of sepsis, then the patient went for a CAT scan. And what they've told is like, hey, instant hernia repair is sound. So then that triggered a you know, question, what? This patient had some kind of you know, um, sigmoid colon resection. Why they mentioned like instant hernia repair sound? Then we realize the fish has been left inside and it has to be, you know, it has to be taken out that people forgot. And that is actually a major legal issue, medical legal issue. So we cannot have these type of mistakes. Now there are a lot of things come back as never events. That means should not happen. So that actually was a big legal issue with that case. So why that happened? Is it because if the nurse is not documenting that or in our operative report, we also, we also have a responsibility to make sure whether the instrument counts are okay. I mean, we do do that, but if we don't document that, you have not done that. So in the court, it won't actually, you know, uh, has got a value if you don't document that. Following the General Medical Council, the Royal College of Surgeons of England also provided a guideline how to write an operative report. It says essential that are clear, preferably typed operative notes for every procedure. The note should accompany the patient into recovery and to the ward and should give sufficient detail to enable continuity of the care by another doctor. If you do a surgery, if you have a team, your registrar or your junior resident or you know, your, your other team members should know what you have done so that it will be easy for them to give the continuity of the care. Again, it emphasizes the same thing. You need to write date and time, whether the procedure is elective or emergency, who are all involved in the case, including surgeon, assistant, nurses, and anesthetist. What is the operative procedure carried out? What type of incision have you put? What your diagnosis? What's your finding? And what is 
any problems or complications you have come across during the procedure and any extra procedures performed. In case if something is not planned but actually happened during the surgery, then you need to document that. Because for example, whenever you know we do uh, um, uh, surgery for, for example, if you're doing for distal pancreatectomy laparoscopically, sometimes you want to retract the liver, you use the, some tooth instrument onto the gallbladder to push the liver up. Sometimes that can cause damage, right? If it caused damage, then you remove the gallbladder, but you need to document in the notes. And again, for example, every cholecystectomy, cholecystectomy is the common surgery being done by the you know, surgeons. It's a you know, bread and butter. And you have to document what you have done with the calyx triangle. If you don't do it, if something goes wrong, it's your fault. So you need to document that. And there are a lot of times we may have, like when we do the gallbladder removal from the liver bed, and we always let the, you know, our trainees to do that. So the trainees, you know, obviously everybody can make mistakes, even the consultants and the trainees, we can make a hole in the gallbladder. The bile may leak. Sometimes it can spill out a lot of stones. We cannot fish out all the stones. It's impossible. We can give a wash. We can take everything. There are instances where the left out stone can cause an abscess in the abdominal cavity. If we don't document that in the nodes, and when the patient presented a few years down the line, with an intra-abdominal abscess, this, whoever the person is seeing, they may find very difficult why this patient have an abscess. If you document it in the notes, it will be very easy for them to find out. Again, you need to write details of the closure technique, how much blood loss, any antibiotic prophylax or DVD prophylax is given, and you need to give post-op instruction and you need to sign. Everybody emphasize the signature, okay? So, pictures. Pictures speaks thousand words. If you are, if you put some pictures, actually that helps, you know, the people who are reading the operative report saying, hey, this was done. I'm going to show some pictures and you can easily, you know, say what has been done. For example, sorry, because I'm a hepatobiliary surgeon, I put the, like Whipple's procedure as a, one of the procedure uh, pictures. So I put Two pictures here and you can see you know both are ripples there is no big difference you can write ripples procedure you can do like hey pancreas head resection done anastomosis done you same thing pancreatic jejunostomy hepatic jejunostomy uh gastrojejunal gj okay so what is the difference here definitely if you if you clearly mean see that you can say there is a difference here in the first picture the the uh Pylorus was preserved, right? Pylorus preserving pancreatic duodenectomy has been done. And there are only three anastomoses. On the right side, you can see the antrum has been resected. So there are implications of resection of antrum. So if we don't mention that, then it will be very difficult if the patient develops any complication. You may not know what has been done. And again, for example, if I'm doing a surgery today, Whipple's, and I have some emergency that I need to leave uh, for another few days, I may not be able to come to the hospital. If you document that or if you just put a picture, your colleague will be able to pick up what has been done and it'd be easy for them to follow up the patients. And again, this is the same thing. Again, same Whipple's procedure, but you can, this picture can clearly show what has been done. I mean, obviously, habitability surgeons will be able, able to easily pick it up, but for the trainees, if you look at that, this is a pancreatic digenostomy, this is a pancreatic gastrostomy, and there are different complications for different procedures. So if the patient develops any complication, depending upon the procedure, we can think and we can manage these patients. So I can tell you, putting a picture is very important. If you can do that, that is the best thing that you can do. And surprisingly, there are already being done on the post-operative notes. This actually is the latest uh, um, the paper from Malawi Medical Journal. It was published in 2018. You can see they've actually went through almost more than... 500 and five, more than 500 operative reports. And it is, it's, it's uh, sad to see that in the operative report, there is no age and sex of the patient reported uh, in 30% of the patient. That means one third of the patient, they just have the name of the patient. There is nothing else. There is no age or sex. So we don't know whether it's a male patient or a female patient. And, you know, um, we used to say, um, when, when, during general surgical training, um, the professors you say, hey, go and do the PR examination and, and measure the prostate size. Then all the trainees went inside and said, hey, this is like a three centimeter, two centimeter. Everybody's giving different description. Apparently the patient was a female. 
So it is like, you know, without knowing what is this, you know, uh, what we are looking for, it's very difficult to uh, say uh, when patient develops complication or something, we don't know what, what we have done is a male patient or a female patient. We need to have that vital information on the operative report. And in the same audit, they've mentioned like one third didn't have a date of surgery and 0% has got timing of the surgery. What time was it started? If the timing is really important because, you know, uh, in the UK, it's called like um, the emergency surgery will happen. Like most of the surgeries happens beyond like five, six o'clock in the evening. It's called emergency surgery. We all know the complications are different for elective and emergency surgery and the morbidity and mortality is something different for elective and emergency surgery. So if we don't have the timing, we even don't know whether it's been done during the daytime or in the middle of the night. And again, they said 35% of the operative reports are not able, not legible, and it is very difficult to read. So if we have an operative report like that, it is very difficult for us to say, you know, you know, what has been done, what we need to do in case of the patient develops complication. And there are, there are actually standards like if you do, uh, if you do an audit on operative report, this is a good project for all the trainees if they want to do it. So the all the, the documentation, there are different sections of the document, for example, patient name, age, sex, time, and um, who are all involved, what procedure has been done, specimens collected. So all this information has to be put in. And the, the standard is at least 80 to 85% should be the, the complaints. But you know, this it says like if it is less than you know 80, it's below par. If it is less than 70, it's actually poor uh, operative report, op uh, poor compliance with the guidelines. So how can we improve operative reports? There are a few options that we have. Obviously, we can legibly, legibly write everything. And you know, if we do legible writing with a pictorial diagram of what we have done, that is fantastic. So you don't need to, uh, it's, it's actually good than you know, any digital record. And there are, you know, if you go to most of the hospitals, like a corporate hospitals or, you know, you know, what do they have? They have like a printed sheet of what is operative report. It gives some kind of performer what, what you need to write. For example, it gives a space for patient details. It gives space for the surgeon's details, anesthetist details, procedure, and all those things. But if you if you follow some kind of performer, actually it avoids you know uh, you making some mistakes or missing information. And standardizing the operative report in the organization, so everybody follows the same. It is not one person writes operative report differently, the other person writes differently. Then it causes a lot of confusion. Standardize it so it will be helpful for us to analyze our data so that we can improve in future. And obviously in the era of you know, digital world, like we need to use the digital technology. Digital technology actually helps uh, in writing this. It actually makes the or writing operative notes very easy. I'll, I'll tell you in the coming slides. But more importantly, what we need is we need to educate the surgeons. So from the training, I mean, uh, you need to emphasize the importance of, you know, the, the importance of the operative report both uh, for the patient as well as for the you know, legal implication. This is something called blue spear that is actually uh, used in the UK. You can see that this is a description of what you know, the digital technology can do. It is like you have to put everything, what side, what procedure, and, what, and then when you click a note, it, it, help, it asks you to put an operative note pops up. So you need to write whatever you want to do. And again, it gives like, what is the indication? and uh, you know, who are all the people in the operating report and who are all the person involved in surgeons, assistant, and all those things. And you can add more and more information. And the one thing that actually come up, come here is like, you know, if you look at the procedure, there are, there are codes for each and every operation, like at the CDC codes, you can actually put it inside so that we know we are, you know, with what WHO recommendation is like, what, what the code that WHO recommends. So we can put those codes. It will be easy for us to analyze our data in the later period. And also it gives an option of, you can select the post-op drugs, for example, antibiotics. What antibiotic you want? What is the dosage? How you want to give? What is the timing? How long do you want to continue? So these are all the clicks. If you click that, then what happens when you do all these things it pops up a report like that, like who has done, what is the number, what is the patient, what is the preparation, what is the interoperative procedure, everything. So it's actually a report which gives enough information 
for you know ongoing care of the patient and also it is legally sound so what are the advantages of electronic records it's legible obviously because it's all typed so you don't need to complain about handwriting so you can just say oh it's all good and it's easy to do rather than writing you know people who knows how to type it will be very quick and easy so that they can easily type and you can save a copy and you can reprint many times with the same quality it is not like you're taking a xerox of an operative report so more you take xerox the quality may not be good but this one you can you know take print many times and it can be easily transferred to the primary doctors because we are in living in the digital world we can transfer the data through email or you know what's you know we, that's the one we are using so even to the referring physicians and it is legally sound if it is time bound because if you look at the operator when whenever we do the operative report like when you click it it actually automatically put the date and time so there is no way that you can go back and change the date and time so when it does that it is legally very sound so in, in any court of court it goes very easily and it is a clear description helps immediate or future surgery for the patient if the patient carries a copy it helps in future treatment also one second let me just show you one case what happened and you'll be able to see um Okay, let me see whether I can share this with you. Are you able to see this? I've shared a screen with uh, the legal implication of- Yeah, operating. yeah, we can. Okay, so actually this case happened in June, 2019, okay? And it clearly says what happened in the, in the operative report. Actually, this was like the, the, the attorneys, what they said is, because the doctors did not write properly, they have to face a fierce question. So what happens is here that there's a gynae surgeon, okay? And uh, they were trying to do a robotic hysterectomy and they injured the ureter. And we all know, I mean, if ureteric injury, it's a complication of hysterectomy. So we can easily say, hey, yes, this is a complication, but this not been, they've described a lot of things on the uh, operative report, but they missed uh, the, the where they've gone closer to the ureter. Did they use diathermy or not? And if they have to use, they have to, they mention the reason for diathermy, then it is acceptable to have that complication. And if you don't mention that in the operative report at all, then this is actually, uh, actually cause, you know, a lot of, uh, questioning uh, from the uh, legal team to the doctors so we need to we need to be very careful in what we are omitting also so omission is also important sorry guys so we need to be very careful like i don't know how can i go back to the previous share let me see Once again, let me just share it again. So you can see the slides again, right? You can. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is like, you know, there are omissions that if you make that can also, you know, work against you legally. And if, I'm going to show some of the operator report that you know I have I have uh, that's that I've practiced. So I'll show you the operator report, and you can say you know, how you feel whether this is good or not. Okay, let me go back to stop share again.
Can you see my screen? Um, Ilango? Not, not yet, not yet. You're not able to see the screen. Is it a pre-operative orders? Can you see? No, no, we are not able to see. Oh, should be good. Can you see now? Yes. Yes, we can. So what I do is I do follow this uh, as what's called a pre-operative orders for hepatobiliary and transplant units. So why I'm putting this is because this is like a simple perform or a skeleton where you can, you know, have some sort of routine so you don't miss. So if you look at the pre-operative orders when we write, there are almost like a 14, 15 components in it. We don't usually remember all those things, but if we have a, some sort of documentation, which you can put it on every patient in the pre-operative orders, it will be easy. The same way you can go to post-operative orders. The post-operative orders, you can see like what date, what procedure performed and what are the orders, like how general orders, antibiotics, IV fluids, pain management, post-operative nausea vomiting, DVD prophylaxis, monitoring, and others, and also including labs, what you want to do. So if we have this type of proforma, it's easy for you to write the post operative instruction without forgetting the important stuff. Because I've seen a lot of post-op orders without having DVD prophylaxis, or sometimes we may, you know, we don't write uh, like PPIs or any, you know, post op nausea vomiting management, we don't write all those things. So if you have a set proforma, it makes you very easy uh, to write the operative report. And I'm going to show you the typical operative report that I used to write. So this is one of my example of you know how I write my operative report. And uh, this is basically, I, I have that skeleton of what I need to do. So I follow this all the time. And feel free to comment if there is something missing also. So usually there is a hospital name that I do put, and uh, we put operative report, we have the patient details, including patient ID, age, and sex. And we need to have the diagnosis. What is the diagnosis that we have and date of surgery. And we always say what procedure has been done and what time it was started and what time this completed. So we got the timing there. And we also mentioned what type of anesthesia, who, are, who is the anesthetist, who are all the surgeons. And here we also mentioned the indication why we are doing the surgery for the patient. You can give a brief information. So what it will help anybody who is seeing the operative report, why we are doing this operation. And it is very clearly mentioned, patient family was explained about the procedure and informed consent obtained. So whenever you write this, even if you, you know, uh, you know if you have this performa, you won't even miss that. I've, I've seen a lot of people, you know, the consent being not signed properly or consent forgot in the morning, we have to do that. So this gives, if you have this habit of doing this routinely, you will not miss those important bits. And then the, the latest one that what everybody we need to do is the WHO checklist. If you don't do that, I mean, like there are a lot of mistakes happening. So most of the hospitals do that. So we need to mention it in the operating forex. I specifically mentioned when the patient was brought to the ward, WHO checklist was performed. That means we have checked the patient. And we also mentioned what IV antibiotics we're given a prophylaxis. And we put the position, what position we have put, what incision, what are all the findings, which includes the important or salient findings. And we have to write the procedure, how we started the procedure. Usually you can divide the procedure into different steps. If you if there is something simple that you don't want to write, that's also okay. But here I divide the procedure into resection and reconstruction because this is a major procedure. So I give each and every description of what has been done during the surgery. You can, you can, if you have the digital documentation, if you're doing the repeat procedure again, you may if even if you make some modification, you can modify this history, the, the body of the operator report, and then you can use it again. So it actually makes writing operative notes very, very easy. And once you've done the reconstruction, if you say that on the resection, I put like a, the blue box because usually I write who does the resection, who does the reconstruction. Actually, it helps us. We know how the person do it. So we can think what complication can happen and how we are going to manage. Again, what all the another final steps? Here, I always mention there is swap instrument counts were correct before closure. This is legally important because, you know, if you, if you write it, for example, if you're writing the operative note, you always check it. That's why we are putting it. So we need to make a note of it. And 
again estimated blood loss okay we know how much blood loss happened and closure how did you close i always try to put some pictures whenever i do take intraoperative pictures if not i'll just draw hand written you know hand drawn diagrams what i have done so this is all the pictures that i always put and even i give the description of what all the structures that we have seen and i always try to put some pictorial representation if i can find one i can use it this is one i used for you know my pppds because it clearly says what i have done so i use this so you know whenever somebody sees the operative report they can see again specimen sent for histology we always need to mention what are the specimen it is very important because if whenever we are discussing patient in the tumor board or in the post op care we can go and check what are the specimen we have sent and how that they have they have been reported if there is anything complication for example portal vein resection bleeding need suturing or something like that you can write it here and again the post operative orders i follow the same thing and then i always put something like please notify the surgical team if the patient has got persistent pain tachycardia high bp or low bp you less that less you don't put fever or every lab result they have to give us a call so that we know what is happening to the patient if you put all these things if something is not happening you can go and question hey i've i've told this why i've not done that so <clears throat> with this i conclude my presentation i'm happy to take any questions and uh, and again thank you for the opportunity wonderful presentation mahesh thank you for sharing a good example uh, you have a lot of youngsters here but i will go first with the questions and uh, all people can share your questions in the chat box or you can put up raise your hands and then uh, we will take your questions so um the first question is that would you prefer to use a standardized um, note op note um which is like uh, you add and change the words or you type them every time that's the first question okay uh see um nowadays everybody become like a, they, we we localize our specialty we do procedures you know um particular to that particular field so there is no harm in having a operative report and then you can edit or modify for the next patient but make sure make sure that you edit everything because he cannot copy the one patient's operative report to another person that's number one number two um here in the us we have a, a software where the our operative reports the salient things needs to be typed for example um if you do a uh, same whipple's procedure and when you go for anastomosis it gives a drop down menu it says like pancreatic jejunostomy pancreatic gastrostomy or pylorus preserving pancreatic duodenectomy or pylorus resecting pancreatic duodenectomy if you click that it sometimes generates operative report according to that still it is your responsibility to make sure you edit the operative report according to what you have done for the particular patient we cannot copy and paste for every patient that, that is there is a dangerous uh, you know habit there but we need to be very careful about whenever you do that please edit according to what you have done uh the second question i have is um in the current era with drop down list should we change our operative note into a form like structure like you, you have given a detailed type written operative note just like how we used to write in the olden times and then uh, you have given it in a digital format would you prefer that if we have standardized check boxes lists there may be better data collection through the operative record mahesh can you stop sharing the slides so that we can have a full picture of who is here let let me thank you thank you okay you can see that right yeah see yeah see, uh, the, the question is like in the digital world it is better i mean like mm -hmm. what i have done is like i always write it on a um uh, word format i add all the pictures and all those things and then i convert it into pdf and i print and uh, put a copy in the patient's notes and also give a copy to the patient again you said like you know this actually will really help in few aspects number one you know most of the hospitals nowadays when they do the discharge summary there is a space for post operative report or operative record so if you do this digital it's easy for them they can copy and paste in the digital discharge summary so everybody knows what has been done number one again what you rightly mentioned the code icd code the type of incision you are using 
antibiotics, drop down, everything, if you put like a drop down or checkbox, over a period of time, you can easily see what we have used in the past year, antibiotic effects, what type of ingestion we've used for the pills in the past years. So it's very easy for data collection also. I completely agree with that. Uh, Pratapan, uh, you have any comments? Pata, sir, you can add up. I see Suji. Sujay Susika, uh, can you come up? Do you use I, I, Pratapan practices as a professor of uh, surgical gastroenterology at Calicut? So he's well known, uh, but just a brief word of introduction. So what do you do in your setup and what do you, what do you tell your PGs? No, I actually, during surgery, I actually describe the procedure to the postgraduate and ask them to write whatever I have done, which I have just described. Because many a time they won't, as Maheshwaran mentioned, they won't detail the important thing which happened in operation. They just write about abdomen opened, uh, bowel examined, and they will just forget to write what uh, anastomosis we have done, <laughs> what, what is, is there any uh, anatomical anomalies, biliary anomalies, etc. So many a time the operation notes will not uh, <clears throat> tell you about these biliary anomalies, arterial anomalies. Uh, many a time I insist on uh, writing those things in the operation notes. But the space provided uh, by the government uh, case sheet is very small. So they are very happy just to include the operation notes. In. But now I made a separate of OT note and uh, asked them to write all these things. I think uh, that should be a good practice. Just the surgeon uh, described the uh, thing to the assistants or whoever is writing the operation notes and uh, uh, make them write the uh, note with all details, which is actually to be included in the operation. Otherwise, they will not uh, write all these things. And that is the one of the mistake we get in, uh, at least in government sectors. Nobody actually dictates the operation notes uh, immediately after surgery. I think that has to be practiced. Pata, sir, uh, is one of the few uh, GI surgeons who have his own software. So how do you manage that? I heard you have, you're using a software for your op notes. Me? <laughs> yeah, that's news. See, the is a lovely lecture, uh, my students. Almost uh, sort of very complete Thank and you, comprehensive lecture. I should say, uh, having worked and uh, you know educated through different institutions, uh, the the concept of operation note writing is very poor. Uh, I do not know. Uh, I I don't know whether it is 50, 60 percent of the operation notes written wherever I work, do not fit into any conventional pattern. There are very, very uh, different types and they're quite inadequate in many, many ways. Uh, actually, as I'll, I'll just take you historically a little bit. When I was an uh, undergraduate at Jitma Pondicherry, we have what is called a record check. Every week, a surgical unit will go to the, uh, the basement uh, record check and then it, it, they, the the medical records department will tag, put a small tag saying that operation note not available in a number of uh, files, because then that's the place where we sit and write the operate note, whatever it is from memory, that is that's one thing. Second thing as uh, Pratapan says in the government sector, if you see the outpatient record is a small slip of paper, you know, o OPD, there you make a diagnosis in three letters and you know, so it, likewise, even operation note, there very small column is there. And as he says, many are very happy to just fill in three sentences or four sentences. Ripple's project can be filled in in five sentences and that is done. Now I'm surprised, uh, my Shran, the, the amount of things you've written. Actually, I think your operation note writing time must be more than the operating time which you took to do people's procedure and you added a history and all that. This is like you, you can publish an article I mean, it's all done completely. If you do a, a little grammarly check and then it's done. That's wonderful. Now I was in the oriented medical sciences. That's an interesting thing. I, here comes the point as to who should write the operate note because, you know, and when should he write? There are two very important points. Uh, I've noticed that but for the chief HOD, he also used to write a couple of notes, but other than him, everybody else had to write their own operate note. And for the chief, the first assistant will write. And every Wednesday record check, we'll see that the number two in the unit has 70 operate note pending. 
50 operate in not spending then you know you have to scribble i mean you just imagine what is that you can read what is that you can remember it is all handwritten actually all those records are kept bound in the, in the institution i mean that's how it used to be but then the interesting point there is there's a weekly record check to check whether operation note is written i think that is a very important thing otherwise many a times you know i've seen also in the place where i work patient is discharged long back there's no operation note you know, there's no checkpoint to say that uh, unless you have an operation note, you you, you cannot, uh, you know, uh, discharge a patient. And, and the check mechanism, is not, I think that should be there. The audit thing should be there. And we should also know who should write. I, I should be ashamed to say, I don't remember when I last wrote my operation note, you know. And then, you know, we, we do complicated surgery every now and then. I don't know, frankly, I don't know who's writing the operation note and whether they're mentioning every little bit which you have seen. I don't know whether the assistant is noticed. Quite often, a second assistant who writes who has no idea what is happening. That is a major, major issue because, you know, the operation steps will be in your mind, but they're never on paper. Then coming to the picture, I'll tell you, uh, our... Uh, Medical students are all uh, very good in biology drawing, but when it comes to operating or drawing, I think that's a miserable thing. It looked like a small cartoon. The stomach doesn't look like stomach, and duodenum doesn't look like duodenum. I don't know, Ilango, I hope you agree with me on that. When you have handwritten drawings, you know, we can't make out which anastomosis goes where. Many a times when the surgeon himself cannot draw, I don't know how the second assistant will draw those things. You know, a couple of things you learned is, you know, about the swab count and the patient is uh, uh, stable all through the procedure and stuff like that. But I don't know what's happening in the corporate sector. I don't remember checking operation notes the last many years. I think I should be ashamed to say that. I, as a clinician, whether I'll be able to do that, I don't know. Here is a system where me and my assistant will move one table to another table before that other surgery gets over. When in, anybody will write an operation note, I really do not know. I think they should be, the people should be made to understand that writing operation note is as important as writing or doing an operation. Everybody is happy doing an operation, but nobody is happy writing operation. It's a punishment. The one person I've seen, Dr. Vijay C. Bose, our orthopedic surgeon, every operation note he writes, every single operation note. Then I asked him, what do you know? I only know what has happened and this is my habit. I think that is a very interesting thing to note that, you know, every surgeon should write his own operation note and then they should have a method by which the operation note should not be written more than a week or if after the patient discharge or a month later or sometime later down the line just to fill in. And I'm sure there'll be many, many hospital records which are operation notes. Back to you, Ilango. Um, so that brings us to the, uh, the one more question here. Right? He has raised up. Do you write your operative note on time or you write a preliminary note, send the patient back to the ward and go and sit in your office and write it? Uh, how do you advise the youngsters to do it? Okay. So just, uh, so th thank you, Radhakshana sir. Actually, you've given a you know, lot of uh, information how things are in the uh, your, your setting or maybe in the government setting. I mean, what you rightly mentioned is, you know, people are willing to do an operation, but they don't want to write the operative report, right? So there should be a system, right? If you don't write the operative, I mean, I'm not, you know, saying that you need to be, you know, harsh with the trainees or something like that. We need to emphasize the importance of it, right? So whenever somebody, some trainees are coming for the surgery, you need to give them a timeline. You need to write the operative report within that particular timeline, okay? So as a trainer, you will be able to do that. Actually, that improves the documentation complaints. Again, the question that you're asked, okay, you're you writing operative notes, like taking more time than doing in surgery. Actually, it is not. What I do is I take all the pictures during the surgery and I actually uh, transfer to my desktop. As I said, I've got everything digitally done. So I go through the operative report that I've got and then I change all those things, just add those pictures. And then I put the post-op instruction according to what it has to be done. So then it actually takes less than 10, 15 minutes. I don't spend more time on writing the op. If you hand, written, hand write the Whipple's pressure, it takes more than half an hour if you want to give every detail in the operative report. So it actually very quick. 
And the question that you asked Ilango, so would you do that immediately or would you do it in office? Obviously I do it in the office because I need to add all these pictures. So uh, there are different ways of doing it. In the US, what we do is something called brief op note. That means you just mention what has been done. And if there is anything complication that happened during the procedure or that's something that you want the post-op team to monitor, then you can put them in the brief op note. And then you can write a detailed op note within 24 to 48 hours. So we have that regulation here. So we need to go and write that. Because, you know, maybe I was trained in the UK and the US. And I, whenever I was practicing in, in India, I always make sure I write the operative report within 24 to 48 hours, irrespective of, you know, whatever uh, the, the, the busy schedule that I do have, make sure. And again, it has to go to the patient's copy notes as well as I give a copy to the patient. Some people may oppose, like, you know, you don't, you don't need to give all this detailed in, you know, information to the patient, but we are not saying something wrong. We are actually very open and transparent with what we have done. So there is no harm in giving the copy to the patient either. So I know, you know, there are a lot of constraints in, in, in writing uh, operative uh, report, but I think it is, it is the responsibility of the performing surgeon to write the operative uh, note. If, you know, if they don't do it, actually it is actually, it's a negligence. So we need to emphasize whoever is doing the surgery should write the operative report. If the trainees are taking part in that surgery, it, it actually helps them to understand the procedure. If they go and write the detailed operative report for the particular patient, they will remember the procedure forever. They can, they can you know, it, it is actually practicing the surgery in their mind. So it actually helps them you know, in, in their training as well. That's my view. Yeah, at one point, uh, my children, uh, regarding the handing over a copy <coughs> of the operation note to the, the patient, I don't know what, but that is the convention in India. I don't remember any operation note ever been handed over to the patient. The, the issue is, say, you injured the common bile duct, would you make a mention of it? Uh, the common bile duct got injured and repaired and this and that and that. You know, there are many, many, actually many things are not added. Many things are, you know, kept under a shroud and, you know, they never gets a mention in the, and actually never, many things are not told to the patient, as, as a matter of fact. So uh, that's a very, uh, very, uh, tricky issue of handing over an operation note to the patient. I don't know whether they understand what we write or whether they'll try to get it uh, interpreted by someone else. I don't know, but uh, the, I, I really, uh, you know, a little touchy about that. Uh, I'm not very sure as to what the law says about handing over operation note to the patient. We actually, uh, yeah. Uh, so with regard to the time, MIOT is very strict. You cannot shift out a patient unless you have a operative. Who checks on it? The, the is nurse, that a, is that a computer, the nurse yeah. comes says this all. Yeah, 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 yeah. The opt-out has to be completed. So, uh, uh, the surgeon usually writes. So for transplants, so the the key main surgeon writes. So I picked up this habit from the U.S. where I I have never written an op note in those two years I have been there. I can write only brief op notes, and the entire operative note dictation can be done only by the consultant. I think they do it in their office. But my job is to make sure that I have all the information on the brief of note. So that's the only job I have done. So here, when I came back, I write every operative note myself. There is a standardized format. It is digitized. Um, and every surgery that I commonly do has a standardized format to capture all the data. And I personally sit and modify each one of them. Now, you know, the one, you know, uh, I'll tell you my day. Morning, as soon as I go in, no, I'll just get into the theater, patient is scrubbed, draped, etc. Then as I finish it, there are uh, some four or five patients in the OPD, then I had to go there. Then by the time I see the second patient, there's another patient on the table, then I, I go in there. You know, by the time uh, things are, you know, a little freaks, five o'clock and it's time to go home. <laughs> yeah, sir, you really need somebody to Who's scribe. writing, what has been written and whether it's anything is written, I don't know. No, I, I'm sure many, uh, Pradhavan would be a, a lot more busier than me in these areas, but I don't know how we manage this. I don't, I have no idea what operation notes are written, really. A any other comment from the floor as well? Yeah, let's go. Uh, Dr. Dr. Naresh, yes, please go ahead. Hi, um, uh, I was invited by Vidya to attend this. I'm one of the... I'm her batchmate and I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon based in National University of Singapore. 
and when I'm, I'm one of the professors of uh, orthopedic spine surgery here. Um, very interesting what you've been talking about. And I think mm, from where I've trained, I, I trained in India, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And I think some description, what somebody made was very correct, that handwritten notes were very poorly written. But mm, as I went off to Britain for training, it was very, very important. All the places where I've worked, it was very important. It is important that the patient cannot leave the recovery area without an operation note being complete. And everybody has a template. I do about uh, I do spine surgery and I do it from uh, C zero or uh, C zero is a uh, base of skull to the sacrum, and I do front and back. And all I have counted is the total number of procedures where I require operative templates are only about 25. So I have operative templates um, for my op notes. And it is very important that the fellow who scrubs with me or the senior most guy who scrubs with me, I ask him to descrub uh, at the time of closure or when skin closure is going on, he needs to open the template and fill in the blanks and add something more then I have time to go through with him because he has done the typing. Uh, and there is a structure and uh, the operative findings are not there. And I think they, uh, they are very important. They need to be noted down. There are about seven or eight important operative findings in spine surgery. One is uh, blood loss, exposure, and all the various things which you said. And the other one is uh, neuromonitoring. So all these patients are neuromonitored all throughout the operation, most majority of them. And then that needs to be um, typed properly. And then I check them. I know some of you are too busy. Maybe we do not have that much of workload um, as much as you all have. So the day on which I'm operating, I am fully dedicated to operating. I don't have to go to the clinic. So that's an advantage we have. So we do, do about three, two or two major cases or three, two, two major case and one intermediate case. And that, that takes us all day to finish. And uh, uh, there's a set pattern and routine. And when I was in Britain, uh, some of my consultants had operative templates, again, for joint replacements. And you had to follow the same template all throughout, whether you dictate or not, so the, uh, the template was there and you needed to dictate on the basis of the template and his secretary would then type and the op notes were available immediately uh, before the patient uh, left the recovery. So I do not remember a hospital where I've worked where op notes were filled later. It had to be done before the patient left the recovery. So I think that's very important. Uh, instantaneous. Yeah, Hospital also, no patients leaves recovery without op operation notes being completed. Uh, it usually, it's almost done by the time patient is received in the uh, recovery room uh, or you know within few minutes. Uh, otherwise, in any case, no patient leaves the recovery room without the operation notes being completed. Uh, Vidya, I see you are uh, uh, the anesthesia chart is a live one where you need to fill in from time to time. Where yeah. is the surgical uh, of notes? I'm, I'm talking about surgical notes. Yeah, talking... how, why, why do you look into those areas? Is that, is that your responsibility? <laughs> uh, come, come again, just say it again. So why do you look into what surgeons are up to and what do they write? Is that your area of responsibility? <laughs> no, no. Recovery room, the, the protocol is that patient does not leave recovery room without the operation notes being completed. That's all. It's a, It's not me. It's the whole system. Okay. Yeah. Well. So, oh, okay. Sir, uh, go on. Go on. Please do go. On. Another interesting thing we have is um, we have uh, PFS, which is a professional fee scheme. So a part of your salary is uh, based on operative throughput. So if you don't fill the op notes, you can't code the patient. And if you don't code the patient the charges don't flow to you. But I think that's an interesting thing. If that is applied to our corporate system, I think everybody will... Everybody will write. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, 
Krishna, you do a lot of day surgery work, so there's no way that your operation notes is not live. I mean, in the yeah, sense, yeah, yeah, it will be live. It, uh, it will be live. Yeah. It goes, it goes under his radar. That's all. <laughs> I, 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 tell I, mean, I, I know all his assistants, so they are very fastidious yeah, people. Yeah, I need to tell you one thing. Uh, it's for a little while. I was working in the government sector in one of the hill stations, and when the one surgeon is doing about ten appendicectomies a day, he has already printed the whole thing. He says the right ovary is normal, right tube is normal, appendix is inflamed, everything. I got check. He's got a printed thing. He'll simply sign. Even that also happens. No, <laughs> yeah. I think that, that that that's a problem with operative templates. You have to check it yourself. Right. Uh, so, otherwise, so, especially in uh, the, uh, this template thing, copy paste. The speaker very properly uh, said uh, that you know you have to check. He told at least five times you have to check for each patient when you have because I, uh, I go through uh, case sheets for morbidity, mortality, and various other reasons uh, case sheets come to me for screening or discharge summaries come. And it, it can it's shameful when you know that male patient somewhere it would have in the template, it will be female or some, uh, you know, somewhere that will be wrong or uh, uh, age will be wrong because they just, you know, didn't bother to modify the previous one. So, uh, very rightly pointed out by the speaker, when uh, templates are used, you have to be very meticulous to make sure that you have uh, cross-checked everything more than once. Okay. Just one more thing I wanted to ask. Now, if you, you, you talked about the incision and the findings, what exactly should a young surgeon do with regard to the findings? How should he record the findings of a particular operation, Mahesh? Uh, each, and, each and every surgery has got some like a crucial steps. For example, in uh, laparoscopic or hysterectomy, you need to mention how many cystic arteries and cystic duct. Okay, So in the finding, you need to mention whether the cystic duct is wide, short, because complication happens when there is an anomaly or if there is an anomaly. So in the laparoscopic or hysterectomy, you need to mention whether, first of all, you need to have some diagnosed laparoscopy. Is there any interesting other findings? And gallbladder, whether it is inflamed, not inflamed, you can actually mention that. But importantly, you need to mention about cystic duct and cystic artery. And in the body of the procedure, you need to specify that you have viewed the critical view of safety. If you don't mention that, you have not looked at it. So this is like some example of what you need to mention in your you know, finding as well as in the operative report. The same thing with the whipples. Whenever you do whipples, we definitely need to make sure there is no metastasis because if you do surgery with metastasis, that's going to be completely not correct. So we need to specify certain things. So, I mean, like you can, you can go give an example of what, you know, for every surgery, but this is an example. So we know as a surgeon, which is important for the particular surgery. So we need to specify that in the finding. And also we need to highlight that in the operative uh, procedure report. I see Sujay uh, Susikar in the uh, um, audience. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you're being an onco surgeon. You know, how do you write the findings? Yeah, actually, I think just now I was going to put in on that, sir. The you main can, thing you is... can put your camera on if you're presentable. Yeah, yeah, one minute, sir. Just give me a minute. Yeah. So, sir, actually, uh, I think this is something which we see as oncosurgeons because many times we see that a patient has been opened up and then he's been closed up and we don't see many of the findings which are very relevant, especially when you're going to plan for your surgery. So, uh, repeatedly. So, I think, sir, findings should be started from the time you make your incision. And I think they, have, they need to mention, but like I think when he was talking about the whipples, like that, when you talk about a malignancy, we want to know what happened when you open your abdomen. What is there? inside the abdomen what were the findings uh, because many times we see that patients i mean they don't talk about the peritoneal disease they don't talk about why the procedure was abandoned per se what was the extent of non-operability or unresectability and even in a patient who's going to be taken up for surgery many a times the entire abdomen findings these things are not coming into the operative notes many times so i think from our side we keep insisting that uh, they need to have a standard uh, protocol, like when you talk about opening the abdomen for a patient with a malignancy, whether the peritoneal surfaces were free, whether the liver was inspected, whether the paraiotic regions, whether the nodal basins, whether they were all examined. 
So I think some protocols they have to follow. That is where actually I think a lot of these uh, printed protocols uh, fall short. I have seen some people, some gynecologists and all that who have a printed protocol for a hysterectomy. They do a CA ovary and they write the printed protocol and uh, they miss a lot of things which are very, very important from the, I mean, even the post-operative patient, when they come to you, when they go to the medical oncologist or they, when they come to another oncologist, we see that a lot of important things are missing. Quite so I, I, I do find that the templates are actually quite useful in not missing the findings. So I have, like um, Dr. Naresh was mentioning, I have templates for every condition. So uh, so that I don't miss any of the findings. I may be doing a yeah. particular no, surgery. What happens is it should be a template for a malignant ovary. If they're going to oh, do, a, right. do a surgery for a ovarian cancer, they need to have a proper okay. template about the ovarian cancer. They, do, they have sure. a template for a hysterectomy. It's like a TAH BSO was done for a uh, ovarian malignancy. So and what is your practice? So what I don't is have your... a written, I, do, I don't have any templates per se, sir. I hmm. always write it down completely. And what I insist per se is usually I write my notes. My assistants close up. I am writing the notes when my assistants are closing up. So you're not busy I... enough as yet. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's a good thing. But uh, when, the, when my assistants are closing up, I insist that the notes and the pathology forms are filled by me. Because I see that many times, like as part of this pathology forms also, the, I make sure that the important things are there so that the pathologists don't have to get back to us to know important things. Pratapan, any comments? Any other comments from the audience? Uh, if I can add one more, uh, see, in the Northern Institute we used to have, whenever the operation list is made, no, there is a, uh, the day before, the surgeon's name, first assistant, second assistant's name is all written. And there's one floor surgeon's name is also there. Floor surgeon name is to check whether the blood is coming in and, you know, to inform people, call people. I think the floor fellows should be given, now that there are so many floor fellows, actually, these days in training systems, more floor fellows than the real operating surgeons. One can be al allocated this job of the make, making sure that the operation note is written. Otherwise, he'll be held responsible uh, and whether the specimens are sent or labeled properly or photographed properly and uh, all the requisitions are written. What do you say, Sujay? I think uh, we can yes, no, for one in such... Hospital. No, we already have this practice in uh, where I teach and also. We have a routine that it is a responsibility of the first assistant in case uh -huh. a faculty is operating or uh, the surgeon himself, in case a postgraduate is operating, it is his responsibility to fill the registers and to make sure that the operating notes is there. And we randomly check now and then the operating notes to make sure that they do not miss out on important findings. Because many a times when we go for studies, especially when we want to take out our notes yes. and you, when we go for retrospective studies and all that, if the operating notes is not filled up, because we have a lot of columns, including blood loss and all that. If they don't miss, if they miss it out there, then tomorrow when we need to go back and do our studies, we find that a lot of crucial information is missing. So we have this habit that we, one particular person is responsible. Even six months down the line, if I see that something is not written properly, we are able to pin it on this person and say, you have not done your work properly. So unless I think you can pin it on somebody and have the responsibility, it doesn't work in systems where you have many people inside the OT. So another thing I noticed, Silango, that you know, in the private sector, all the surgeries go by the chief's name, whether it's scrubbed or not scrubbed. Actually, if something goes wrong, you do not know who's a surgeon. Uh, many a times I put, you know, when I was looking at the records, everywhere my name is there as a chief surgeon. And if, uh, you know, I don't know who's the surgeon is operated. I think we should have a method by which you should, you know, write the fellows operated and only we understand that. So there are, um, I don't know, uh, I saw Mahesh on writing the full name, but uh, between me and Vimal, we share who dissects and who reconstructs. And you, you, you write that? There is a small initial which I write, VV. Sometimes his bile ducts done by him, I, I make mention of that. Uh -huh. So that he, he also knows which patients he needs to follow up and things like that. So it, it is there, but it is in a sort of code. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I joined a little late, so I don't know whether you discussed this. But uh, Dr. K. R. Balakrishnan, cardiac surgeon, in uh, he's he used to say that in uh, Ramchandra they they had a thing of uh, they will just uh, you know record the the notes and then the medical transcriptor guy will uh, sit and type so that you can save some time. You just you just uh, talk the steps through and hand it over and then somebody else types. 
of course now we have moved to uh, you know complete different uh, digital age in the past 10 years but uh, maybe radha krishna something like that will work for you to save time you can <laughs> dictate your notes as your i think most of the us surgeons do that ma'am those yeah. who are trained in I mean, us they, they all do the dicta then it is to be like that no written in the secretary is the time when you speak into the the voice recorder and now see the, the where is the time in the sense that in most corporate sector surgeons you see they have no time to dictate anything you know the first assistant or whoever has to take a cue and note down and but i think uh, we need to change unless until you get caught in some very difficult uh, legal situation i think you you are unlikely to improve on it because you know um many 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 surgeons uh, private sector very busy surgeons you know that i don't think they write any office you know, and they never check it also they just leave it to who's there who's ever is the first or second assistant i think why it's, it's important i think after this particular discussion that we need to many of us need to wake up and uh, it will just take one bad medical legal case to drag the busy surgeon no, down with you so they have to really make time for the notes i i don't think there's any escape from that no yeah there is no shortcut in that i think that madam i think we all have to understand because when it goes to a medical legal problem uh, the notes speak a lot of words i have had an experience where just my op was so op notes were so detailed that i got out of a situation very happily even our op notes i think taking down the this thing so i think operator notes there is no way out but to make sure that uh, we handle everything very carefully Yeah, Elango, unmute your mic, sir. Thank you to everyone who have participated, especially to Maheshwaran who took up this assignment at the last minute, and um, and a wonderful talk by him. We'd like to see him more often uh, in Let's Learn Surgery and the LGS platforms. And thank you for everyone for participating and contributing to uh, the growth of the youngsters. And and sometimes you know there are things that. Uh, even we can learn from listening to these lectures thank you very much everyone we'll meet again next week for another interesting session on let's learn surgery thank you